On behalf of alumni relations here at Dartmouth, I'd like to welcome you to the first back to class faculty talk of 2013. Some of you may remember these lectures as chalk talks. The names changed, but the same stimulating high quality of the talks remains. My name is Robin Albing, and I'm the Director of Continuing Education and Travel here at Dartmouth. We strive to create learning activities and opportunities for our alumni and their families and their friends all throughout the world. We do this through our travel program. We do it here in Hanover through reunions and homecoming and things like these faculty lectures. And this afternoon, I'd like to put in a plug. We have something called the Wisdom Symposium, where three Dartmouth professors will be getting together to talk about the concept of wisdom. I'd invite you all to attend. We also do things across the country, including our Dartmouth on Location program, where we take Dartmouth, Dartmouth professors, and special programs to our alumni across the country. Please check out our Alumni Relations website and the list of all of our events. And please be sure to pick up some of our travel brochures that are outside on the table if you haven't already. Also, there's a postcard out there that tells you all of the upcoming back to class lectures. We hope you've had a chance to register to win a Dartmouth coffee mug, and I'll be giving that away at the end of Vicki's presentation. We'd also like, hopefully you got a chance to help yourself to coffee and a snack. Before our program begins, we ask you to please turn off or silence your cell phones. Our schedule this morning includes a presentation by Professor May, followed by a time for you to ask some questions. And Professor May said that if you have a burning question while she's presenting, please raise your hand and she'd be happy to answer it. She loves participation. So without further delay, Professor Vicki May has brought a passion for teaching to the Thayer School of Engineering at Dartmouth. And her students recognized that passion when she was chosen through a vote by the class of 2012 for the Jerome Goldstein Award for Distinguished Teaching. Professor May's research focuses on engineering education, inquiry-based learning, and seismic engineering. And this past summer, Professor May spearheaded the Summer Engineering Workshop at Dartmouth, which gave high school students the chance to design and build their own engineering projects and prototypes, to develop lessons that cultivate interest in science, math, and engineering, and to learn from Dartmouth faculty, staff, and students. She also works with the $300 House Project, which is a joint effort across departments, including the Tuck School of Business, the Studio Art Department at Dartmouth, and the Dartmouth Center for Healthcare Delivery Science. Professor May came to Dartmouth in 2005 and joined the full-time faculty at the Thayer School of Engineering in 2010. She received her BS in Civil Engineering from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities and her MS and PhD in Civil Structural Engineering from Stanford University. Please help me welcome Professor Vicki May. Good morning. Is this okay? Uh, thank you. I read it in the paper yesterday and I said, really? That's me? Okay. Um, Robin asked me to talk about what's going on in engineering. I do want you to interrupt me if you have questions, comments. Okay. Um, what I'm going to focus on is what, what I've, I'm passionate about is engineering education and changing the demographics of engineering ed engineers. So I'm going to look a little bit at how engineers are perceived how we might change those perceptions, how we can diversify, and then what we're doing at Thayer to kind of try to make engineering cooler. Okay. So I'm gonna ask you to think here, see? Participation already, okay? What is one word you'd associate with engineers? What did I hear? Technology. Technology, okay. Thing? I miss science. Fussiness. Fussiness? Really? Architecture. Notice I missed fussiness. All right, so we got the idea here. All right, now I'll make sure I get fussiness. Of course, I don't. Fussy. Can't spell it, though. <laughs> 
What's one word you associate with engineering as a career? What do engineers do? Money. Well, money, that's a good one. Wait, I, wait, I think I'm not in the right one, though. It doesn't qualify for professors, though, does it? <laughs> engineering as a career, any other things? Plan. Plan? OK. Happening, I like that one. Diligence. You do need diligence or the building's going to fall down. All right, so that gets us started. So there were some surveys that went out. So I was going to show, um, this was a national survey. Intel sponsored it. It was by a group called um, Engineering for Change. And they asked one word that's associated with engineers. Um, there were, there were other words that came up, but these were two of the most popular, smart and boring. Um, smart, I guess, is good, but I have some problems with smart, too, because I feel like it makes it exclusive. You have to be really smart to be an engineer. OK, luckily, I got under the wire. I'm not really smart, but I'm still an engineer. Uh, boring, I have some issues with boring, OK? Um, but that was what the teens' perceptions were. Another survey, this was a Harris poll, a little bit older, 2004. Um, these are good words. I like these words. Inventive, creative. What I don't like is the 2% and the 3%. <laughs> I'd like to see those much higher. Uh, and I think it probably has raised since 2004. But so what I'm looking for is people to associate words like creative, inventive um, with engineers. This was an interesting survey. This is the Intel survey. It's not surprising that difficult and boring were pretty big on that. Those, so here we see difficult. And boring, OK, this was the same survey that said we were smart and boring. Um, this is engineering as a career as opposed to engineers as people. Okay. The significant thing about this is when they talked to this group of thousands of teens, age 13 to 19, about engineering, perceptions changed dramatically. So, so those who understood what engineering was um, shifted, made, then rated it a lot more gratifying, cool. There's a word I like. Okay? and collaborative and a lot less boring and difficult. Hey, what do engineers do? This was uh, another poll. These were the two most popular, build and fix things, and sit at a desk or a computer all day. Okay? Um, yeah. <laughs> that Intel survey, though, when they looked at uh, how they could change perceptions. So one of the biggest things that caused people to change perceptions or teens to change perceptions is understanding that there was a potential for engineering to help others. Um, so help others, financial was another big thing. So when somebody said money earlier, that did change. That did change. Oh, maybe I do want to be an engineer if they, I, I prefer to look at this one because I want people to go into engineering for the right reasons, not just for the money. Um, but so, in a, you know, I, changing this perception from building and fixing things, which isn't a bad thing, um, I'd rather they said we were designing and creating things, but you know, it's not a terrible thing. I don't sit at my desk all day, but um, but showing students that engineers make a difference, that doctors aren't the only ones that make a difference, was a big um, game changer. Okay, I made my children watch Ratatouille with me last night. Okay, they're like, Mom, we've already seen Ratatouille. Um, everyone seen Ratatouille? It is one of my favorite movies. Um, so this is Remy. Remy wants to be a chef. Okay? And everyone at the beginning, the critic, what is the critic's name, Eno? I think it's Eno. Um, says, no way. Rats can't be engineers. They just don't have the right skills. Um, and I actually still hear that a lot. No, that student can't be an engineer. They don't have the strong enough math skills or, or um, science skills. Um, I would say anyone can do engineering. Okay? We just have to figure out how to get them up to speed. Okay? The face of engineering at Thayer. So these, these students have all been in my class, and there's, most of them are still around Thayer. Okay? But the statistics at the bottom are what is probably most important. Um, Thayer does a really good job of percentage of females, especially relative to the national scale. Um, so if you look at this, this is in 2011, 32.6% of the Thayer student body was female. And in 2012, it was 28.8, okay? which is not bad. Um, NSF national surveys, it's at 17.9. So we are consistently around 30%, which is somewhat higher. So part of what we're trying to figure out is why that is and what we're doing right that makes um, it attractive to women. Um, 
But we're not the only place. I taught at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo for seven or eight years. Um, percentage there was high. There, I think the percentage was high because I was in the architectural engineering department and we drew a lot of women that were interested in the creative hands-on side. But that's, I think, why we're drawing them at Thayer too. Okay. On the mini minority side, we're almost at national average. Um, again, we're a New England school. You know, I, we could do better and we're trying to. But. Okay. I like this quote from William Wolfe, who was a past National Academy of Engineering president when he talks about diversity. So diversity to him means women and underrepresented minorities, but it also means individual diversity. And I, th I think that's what we do really well at Dartmouth as opposed to other schools. Um, and I was gonna talk about that for a minute. Do I have any engineers in the audience? Just one? He's an engineer, but he's not claiming it. <laughs> Come on, engineering's cool, remember? <laughs> yes. So engineering at, at Thayer is a little bit different. We're interdisciplinary, we don't have departments. Most schools have departments, have civil engineering. I was trained as a civil engineer, so pretty narrow field. Um, Dartmouth doesn't have engineering disciplines. We're all one big happy family. Okay. Well, most of the time. Um, there's a focus on liberal arts, so more so than other schools. Uh, Thayer engineering students take at least a third of their courses are in liberal arts classes, and we think that makes a stronger engineer, a broader thinking engineer able to integrate and build things that are actually useful. Okay. We do have a strong focus on innovation and creativity. We have classes on creativity. We have a new, was the first in the country, PhD in innovation. Um, so we have PhD students coming with the whole goal of basically coming up with an idea to make their own startup. Okay. We're very project-based, and I will show you some of the projects we focus on and hands-on. Now, Cal Poly was very hands-on too, but I think that's one of the keys. So I, I decided I needed to focus a little bit. I didn't want to talk about all of engineering, but if there's specific questions you have, please ask me. So I'm looking at two specific projects that I've been involved with recently um, that I think show students that we can make an impact on the world and we can be creative, which are two of my big goals. And that's the $300 house project, and I'm going to answer it right now before anyone asks, no, we don't have a house that only costs $300. We're working on it. It's an aspiration. And um, a summer workshop that I led this summer um, that we're going to try to grow in future years. So first, the $300 house project. Anyone familiar with the $300 house project? So uh, VG, uh, VG, we call him VG, um, was the one who started the $300 house project. And he's a business professor. He, he wrote a book called Reverse Innovation. The idea there is most innovations currently come from the developed world, but maybe uh, we could reverse that and from the underdeveloped world or developing world, we could start some innovations, innovations that really target affordability and um, address needs. Um, so his first, so he proposed in a blog post a $300 house and this was the sketch that he put on the blog and he asked the world really to come with, up with ideas to come up with affordable housing. Um, and it went viral, it, it took off, everyone was responding across the world um, they ended up having a contest to see who could come up with a concept for a $300 house. These were the entries. It was all done online, but there were people from Germany and South America, New York, LA, um, all over the world. Australia um, submitted designs. They picked 16 that were awarded cash prizes, um, and 10 of them were invited to Dartmouth for a design workshop where we, uh, we all worked together. Um, and I was involved as kind of a judge, and then I was involved in the design workshop. And really, my interest in it was getting students involved. So we had lots of students involved in the design workshop that happened here at Dartmouth, and they got very excited about working on a $300 house. The $300 house led us to Haiti. We decided we needed to focus on a single area as opposed to making a $300 house that could go anywhere. Um, there was a recent, or the, in 2010, there was an earthquake that devastated Haiti, and Haiti was a very poor country. This is Haiti, uh, shares the island with Dominican Republic. This was me on our first trip. This was our first Dartmouth affordable housing team. Lots of medical teams have gone to Haiti after the earthquake. Um, this was the team that went down to look at affordable housing. We visited three spots, Fond de Blanc, Port-au-Prince is the capital, and Mirbali. Mirbali is where Paul Farmer is building a big, beautiful hospital. Okay. So we were looking at what we could do. Um, this is so this is 18 months after the earthquake. 
and I took these pictures when I was there. The country is absolutely devastated. This is Port-au-Prince, so this is urban infrastructure there. Okay. Trash issues, and this is what I cannot convey in a, a PowerPoint presentation, but riding around in a hot climate with trash everywhere, no garbage disposal, you just can't, you can't bring that smell to you. I guess I could try. Dan, next time, should I try that? <laughs> um, major issue. Okay. The rural infrastructure. So this is one of the places we stayed, Fond de Blanc up in the rural peninsula. Um, those are the roads that the trucks navigate. Um, this is the main downtown a latrine, but 90% of the country has no latrine. This house up here is a typical house. So this area was not hit by the earthquake, but this is just a typical house. I don't have upwards of 10 people staying in a house that size. It's a, it's a warm climate. They really use it to get out of the rain and to sleep in, but still. Um, major problems. Uh, when I first arrived, they have, all the trucks have snorkels on them. I'm like, what do they have snorkels on? It's because they don't have bridges, so if the, if the water, water's high, they just go through and hope that they keep their snorkel above water. Anyway, my dean probably shouldn't know these things about my travel there. Um, water and electricity were other problems. The, there is not really electricity, so lights go off in the evening, or there aren't lights in the evening. Uh, cholera is a big problem. So um, cholera actually was brought there after the earthquake, so water is not safe. So people first are transporting water a long way uh, or standing in line for safe water to drink. Okay. So these were the issues I brought back to Thayer, and I said, let's, as to the students, I proposed them to the students and said, let's tackle some of these. Um, these are the, in, the engineering projects over the past couple years that we've worked on. I have since been back to Haiti, and we're planning future trips. Um, my interest was mainly in getting the students involved in a real project. So I like the students to work on real projects. Yes? We had, to get, we had to get a lot of permissions, and it's on, a, it's on a red list, so we had to get lots of special permissions from Dartmouth and sign, sign lots of waivers to go in. The Haitian, the Haitian government wants people to come in and help, so it wasn't so much that Haiti did not want us there. I mean, we were working with NGOs on the ground there, so. So the people, they themselves were very receptive to you. Yes, and we, we stayed. We're working with the St. Boniface, which is a hospital down there primarily, and we work closely with them. And that is important to me. I don't like to see people go into developing countries and just plop something down. I saw lots of houses like that, where it was just a plywood box that someone had said, here's a new house for you. Um, so we like to work with the community, okay? But that is, that's an excellent point. The permissions, though, were more from Dartmouth and the US side. Um, We have gotten some grants, um, you know, not huge grants, but you know, I'm not looking for huge grants. I'm looking for enough grants to buy supplies for students to build prototypes. Yeah, but yes, we did. We did get some, some money for that. Okay. This was one project, the Dartrine, okay, the Dartmouth Latrine. We actually put a sign on one in Haiti. Um, this team, it was one of the first projects. They were looking at um, length of time, of, for composting and different, different methods that you can make simple. There's a lot of concrete, these CMU blocks in Haiti, so they were using materials that were available there and how could you build a latrine. Again, 90% of the country doesn't have any type of latrine or uh, waste removal facilities. So this was one of the projects, one of the early projects. The following year, another team of students abandoned the dartrine and went for a solar latrine. Um, and we still have this prototype model. It was actually a really nice, prototype, they did a lot of testing. Their goal was to use solar energy to kill the cholera or all the pathogens, which is the major problem. So they really focused on that. They wanted something that was simple and easy. So they built this mechanism on the top that rotates around and keeps it in the sun for a certain amount of time. Um, and it just sits on a barrel. And that's Kent showing how it's going on a barrel. And that didn't show up very much. But um, they worked with people at the medical school and looked at, uh, did testing of when the pathogens were, were killed. There was a water pump project last year as well that was um, very successful. So this is a team of students, Annie, Katie, Kevin, and Robbie went down for two weeks and they collected a lot of solar data and they looked at their water is a big issue. So this is again in Saint, in near St. Boniface, the hospital that we stay at. Um, they had a diesel pump that was pumping water, but it was breaking all the time. 
Um, so it was very unreliable and they were talking about abandoning it. So these guys went in and evaluated different strategies. Um, solar, pico hydro, um, wind. They were mainly looking at renewable energy sources that they could possibly take down. Um, they landed on, decided on solar um, and got funding from the Kellogg Foundation and they're actually going to implement that in November. Okay. So that project, again, they worked with the local people and they're going to bring in a backup for the diesel, but hopefully we'll be able to get off the diesel. The room, you go in the room of the water pump with the diesel and you go, oh my gosh, I got to get out of here. Um, so that'll be, a, I think, a nice improvement. For my 71 class, I teach a structural analysis class, and I charge them basically with a $300 house. I said, we're not going to go in and give them a house, but I'd what we can offer is testing some different things. So we have the testing facilities, we have the computers, we can show what might work, in, uh, might be an affordable approach, um, but also be safe in earthquakes. Um, so one thing that the students got excited about, so I really just gave it as an open-ended project, and I said, see what you come up with. Um, me. Yes. It's exactly what it sounds like, compressed earth. So what they do is they dig up, dig up earth. The beauty of it is you use local materials, dig up earth, you put it in this press, and I wish I had it in action, but that orange part comes down. This is actually in Port-au-Prince. They have a facility there. They've been building them. They, they do put a little bit of cement in, but it's mainly dirt. And so, I mean, it's, it's adobe taken to another level. So there is a machine that compresses it, and the compression makes a fairly strong block. But it's, it's, so it's, it's cheap because you're digging up local materials, adding a little bit for binder, and adding a lot of pressure. Um, I, have, I do have a little video of this in action where a couple guys hang on the end of it to compress it down. It's all mechanical. We're trying to keep it very cheap. I've never heard, and I read a lot, I've never heard of this. So have we done this in other countries too? We have. India has done it a lot. It's actually with the movement here in the US towards sustainable design, people are building with it a little bit here, not a lot. I know some people in Indiana who are building some compressed earth block houses. So, um, and they got excited about making, I think they did a lot of Legos as kids. This team got excited about making different shapes that would interlock better. Um, but that's okay. They're excited about learning and trying things. I was okay with that. So they actually, the, one team last year in my 71 class built the actual press. So we have a press that's gonna go up to the organic farm. Um, they spent so much time on the press that they never really built a wall, but they made 20 blocks. Okay, I still gave them an A. <laughs> another team got excited about bamboo. So uh, another thing about Haiti is it's pretty deforested. So they've cut down all the trees to make charcoal, um, which is sad, but they're also trying to live and heat and cook. Um, so Cornell has gone down and built a bamboo plantation, uh, which... So the, these students decided they were going to build a house. This is just the roof of a house out of bamboo. So we got bamboo. It's about four inch diameter bamboo. I should have brought some. Um, I already brought a lot of stuff, so I didn't bring the bamboo. This, this roof is actually over in Thayer. It's in the large frame lab with the formula hybrid racing car. Okay, the formula hybrid racing car probably gets more attention, but then I always point them to the bamboo roof on the side. Um, and this is hopefully going to go up to the organic farm. Uh, and Rosie and Scott are talking about building a, a bamboo house up there. Um, so this team got excited about bamboo. They're going to use the Cornell plantation. Uh, it's fairly cheap. It's a weed. It grows fast. It would help the deforestation problems. They came up with a, you know, again, this isn't completely new. India, um, Bali, they do a lot of bamboo. So they took some ideas, but they learned how to make it themselves. One student got so excited about bamboo that he spent this past summer uh, building this weapon, is what it looks like on the top corner. Can't believe I got away with that. Um, but it, is, it splits the bamboo really efficiently and quickly. Um, so that was what he did. Um, he's also, he did the Tuck Bridge project and he's excited to go down to bamboo and market this. I hated to tell him how poor they were, but he was excited about it. Okay. One team got excited about plastic blocks. So they were gonna solve the trash problem by using all that plastic and make blocks. Um, and again, that's not completely new. They did some investigation. They found this guy, Harvey Lacey, who had built a lot of trash block houses. Um, and he's built one in Haiti, and when they talked to him, he said, the trash blocks work okay, but I use a lot of rebar, so it's still expensive. Rebar is the steel reinforcement. Um, so the blocks themselves work pretty well. They're nice and lightweight, which is great in an earthquake, but he wanted some investigation. He didn't have the testing or the analysis background to figure out how much rebar was really needed, so he would just put a lot in, okay? So um, a team at Dartmouth, this is Nate. Nate, a rugby guy, isn't he? Um, 
tested a bunch of walls and tested different variations of steel in the wall um, and then fed that back to Harvey and hopefully that's making a difference since Harvey's really actually building things in Haiti. Okay. Another team decided also on trash, but they were gonna take the trash and shred it, the plastic, shred it and put it in concrete, which has been done before, but not in Haiti. They borrowed my paper shredder. My paper shredder has never been the same. They shredded a bunch of plastic um, and looked at different mixtures of concrete and plastic. And the plastic then kind of acts as a binder and a reinforcement, so you can re reduce the amount of steel that you need. Um, they built a bunch of mini walls. I think they built nine total walls um, and then tested them. They tested core samples and also, a, this is one on the bottom, a lateral force, and you see there's a big crack. Um, but again, informing people of what works and what might not work. Not building a whole house, but looking at different materials that might be possible. Earth bags, so this team got excited about earth bags, um, earth bag construction. They take the rice bags, when the rice that comes in, they fill it with soil. Um, again, they reinforce them, so they take the bags and stack them up on top of each other put rebar in between and through the corners. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of testing done on it. They worked with uh, Patty Stouter in New Mexico, who's done a lot with earth bags. And she helped the team figure out what testing we needed. Patty kept saying, we need, we need a shake table, we need a shake table. And as an earthquake engineer who lived in California for 13 years, I was like, I really should have a shake table, okay? It would make my life complete here at Dartmouth if I had a shake table. So this student in the left corner, we got some funding and he actually well, we were gonna buy it. And he said, oh, for that money, I could build you a much fancier uh, shake table. And I said, well, another student project, I'll get a fancier table, let's go for that. So he built this table. It, it doesn't look fancy here, but it is, it is nice, okay? It's 30 inches by 30 inches. It can take 500 pounds and it has a motor that, a shake table, it causes an earthquake, okay? Um, and it moves back and forth. And you can do different frequencies and look at when things collapse. Um, I put students on it on occasion too, see how they can handle the shaking, okay? This student, uh, Awais, he got excited about earth bags. He's from Pakistan. Um, he wanted to look at affordable housing that he could take back home, which if anyone read about the earthquake, there was an earthquake there, was it last week, 7.7. .7. Um, he went on to work, he's working at Columbia on his uh, master's, um, looking at affordable housing. And he did a lot with the shake table and different testing. He took it beyond the class and looked at it as an independent study project. Okay. So that was kind of the $300 house. And again, like you brought up, I'm not, I'm not building a house and sending it down. I'm kind of trying to get students, I'm getting, I want students to get excited. That's what I care about. Um, but then come up with ideas that might work that they can test. Okay. I'm gonna shift gears. The other project I worked on recently was uh, a summer workshop that we call Design It, Build It. Um, the goals of this project were to have students gain a better understanding. That earlier Intel study said students, teens who knew more about engineering had better perceptions of it, so hopefully getting students to understand it a little better. Developed some skills, so we did some design thinking and problem solving workshops. We did a lot of computer-based and hands-on activities, and I wanted to increase interest and perception. Okay. So to show the breadth of what engineers do, we did a lot of going around there and looking at things that people had done. Um, the die wheels were a big hit for, for obvious reasons. We got to ride in the die wheels or drive the die wheels. This was a class project, so en Engine 146, one of our more advanced classes, their, their project is to build and then compete in a die wheel contest. Um, so I let the, the high school students ride in those. We went into the biomedical lab. This is John Collier's lab. John Courier and Dr. Mayer are leading, uh, showing them implants. Their lab does a lot of testing on biomedical devices. Um, Jason Stouth, who does a lot of solar engineering, brought in his solar panels and they actually did some measurement and testing of the solar panels. So getting around, just here I was just trying to show the students there's a breadth of things that we engineers do. We don't just build and fix, but we help people too. Peter Roby came in and did a design thinking workshop and they were pretty shocked when he he told them, okay, your first task is to go downtown Hanover and interview people. I think his project for this day was uh, more portable, portable healthy snacks. So their first task was to go downtown and interview people. And they were like, wait, en engineers don't talk to people, do they? <laughs> but they did it. They went down and they came back with some great, great interview um, and then came up with some great ideas, built some prototypes. The machine shop was a tremendous hit. So this is Jenna, she's showing them how to use the lathe um, 
They also did a step-by-step. -step. They built these wiggle cars, and they had to go to each of the different machines to get a different part. So they got the wheels from the injection molder. Um, the top came from the thermoforming. Uh, they had to do a little soldering of the electronics, and then they built this little car that follows the line. Okay. But going, the goal here was to have them go to each of the different machines and get a different piece. We did a lot of designing and building. Uh, so up in the corner, they're designing wind turbine blades. We did gliders. It was a nice, easy, I didn't bring a glider either, but um, we used a laser cutter to cut out pieces of plywood to make their own glider, which is a nice, easy start because it's all two-dimensional. You can break it down. Um, they got to choose from a larger scale project. Their choices were a longboard, a robot, a telescope, and an electric guitar. And those were pretty popular. Longboard and electric guitar were particular, particularly popular. Uh, but they had to design it. They had to do all the cutting on the laser cutters, decide how long or they wanted it to be, how, on the neck of the guitar they had to figure out the shape. Um, they were a little grumpy about the MATLAB program they had to do to figure out the fret spacing, but then they were proud of it at the end. So hopefully they learned something. We used a lot of SolidWorks. Um, and this is the glider, one of the gliders that they made. This glider is one of the fanciest gliders you'll ever see. It has, it, it can sh shift the, the angle of attack of the wings. It can shift how much they're, they're going sideways. Um, and they got to change any of that. I was thinking that they would only want to do the wings and I was worried about SolidWorks. It's a CAD program, computer-aided design. And I was like, oh, this is gonna be too much for them. They're younger than me. They took off. <laughs> I taught them how to do the wings, and they're like, well, when do we do the bodies? I'm like, well, go for it. If you want to do the bodies, make a new body. Um, so they, they just ran with that stuff. Um, they like the spinning tops, and I think I have a couple spinning tops here. And you can come up afterwards and look at all the fun steps. But it was pretty empowering. They took a stock, a tube of aluminum, they drew a picture of a spinning top, and then they could make, you know, it's hard to see from here. They made lots of different designs and, and went to the machine shop and cut them on the lathe, which was fun. We made 3D puzzles. Um, the spatial reasoning with those 3D puzzles is pretty amazing. They had to draw the little pieces they wanted, and then on the computer they would fit them together, you know, and have to figure out which faces had to mate. It doesn't sound like a lot, but if you try it, it's hard. Um, again, I was worried that they would, this is too hard, we shouldn't be making them do that. Um, they loved it. Uh, they, there was not, it, it was not without frustration but they all accomplished it in the end, and um, I think it was really one of their favorite activities. Okay. I did ask them at the end what they liked, and all of the computer-aided design and machining went at the top. So the gliders were on the laser cutter, SolidWorks just tutorials they loved, um, the spinning tops and the 3D puzzles. Those were all uh, SolidWorks-based or computer-aided design activities, um, and they were a big hit. And I wanted to end with some, we'll almost end. This is some students' perspective. So this is the students from the, hang on. There we go. This is from the workshop, a video I was not involved in making. Before I came into this workshop, I thought that engineering was all just wiring, and I thought that it was really, really narrow, and there wasn't a whole lot of wiggle room. But after being in this course, I've realized that engineering can be really broad and consist of a bunch of different exciting things. Before I went to this camp, I thought of engineering as being more calculated and objective and very straightforward, but uh, after this camp, I've realized that a lot more creativity is necessary. I thought engineering was a lot of math and um, not a lot of like hands-on work and problem solving. But since I've been here, I've learned that it's a lot more like figuring stuff out and doing a lot more like hands-on work and like designing stuff on the computer, which is really cool. As I started doing this more, I started to realize that there is a lot more involved. There's actually uh, tinkering with stuff. There's a lot of different technologies involved computer programming, as well as a lot of hands-on things. And I think it's actually given me a much better idea of not just engineering, but what aspects of engineering there are. What I thought about engineering for this workshop was that I didn't really think much of it, but after this, well, still during this workshop, I think that engineering is a big deal, and it opened my eyes 
and I kind of want to do this in the future as a job, maybe. All right, so that's what the students said. And I was happy about that. They thought it was creative. That was my goal. Everyone knows we, we do math, but. Um, I, since all the CAD stuff and 3D printing, laser cutting is such a buzz right now, I did bring lots of things, and if you have questions about that. So the machine shop at Thayer is kind of the heart of Thayer, I would say. Um, we build and make a lot of things. Um, we have a class that I teach that does bridge contest every year. One year we did a 3D printed version when they had to show the stresses on the bridge and predict where it was gonna break. Um, so this is a 3D printed version. We've done a simpler laser cut version. This, you know, they had to figure out how to make this fit together. Most of them glued it. This was my version. My version is boring. Theirs were much more exciting, okay? There are bridges that fit together. This year I'm co-teaching the class and the guy I'm co-teaching with is wants to make towers and then use lasers and dry ice. So yeah, I don't know. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, 3D printing, so laser cutting, you take a t it's a two-dimensional. You take a piece of wood, do people know what laser cutting is? And laser cuts through. And we, we cut acrylic, um, acrylic and plywood are the main things we cut. Um, we also have 3D printers, we have four 3D printers. So this was 3D printer. So 3D printing is an additive process. It's, it is what it sounds like, there's a little nozzle. And you're welcome to come over and stay up there to Thayer and see it at any point. Um, little nozzle that you know runs back and forth and adds plastic in layers and builds up. This is one of our bigger objects. The machine shop told me I had to bring it. This is Sylvanus Thayer, the founder of our engineering school. The way they did this is the student scanned. They used a 3D scanner to scan a statue of Sylvanus, and then they were able to build a model and print it. Okay. Um, this is about as big as our printers will do. There's lots more expensive printers that will print bigger things. But students, if they need something bigger, will print them in pieces and then fit it together. Okay. Uh, when I was down in the machine shop, they were doing these. This is one of our newest toys, uh, ShopBot. This is for the upcoming Lego contest. But they're making trophies. This isn't, isn't done, but it shows the etching you can do. And the nice thing about the ShopBot is in addition to cutting a two-dimensional shape, it can go three-dimensional, and so it can carve things out. Um, okay, when the students found out I was doing the new face of engineering, they decided we needed a bobblehead. Okay, so I have my very own personal bobblehead. <laughs> this is the face of engineering, okay? Um, and it was really simple from my part, and I still can't believe I agreed to it. But they took an iPad and took 20 pictures around the side of my head, and they were be able to use software and stitch it together. So for my part, I spent like five minutes on this. Um, they stitched it together, made a 3D model. It's not perfect. You know, I'm much more beautiful in real life than this. Uh, but it was pretty quick and easy, so everyone can go over and make their own personal bobblehead. The head can be in the 3D printer? Yeah, so the head it goes in the 3D printer. And that's, that's it up there, too, right? Yeah, that's it up in the top corner. Okay. I did add pictures, and so this summer when I, when I talked to the students, I said, you know, we're going to do puzzles and gliders and lots of fun stuff but I did always try to bring it back to things that help in engineering, um, prosthetics. One of my favorite articles is about a little boy who um, was gonna die because there was something wrong with his trachea, and they 3D printed him a new one, and he's now fine. Um, so there's lots of good uses for 3D printing, and it is changing the way we do things. It's definitely changing the way we manufacture things. You know, you used to have to spend months building a small prototype out of steel or whatever it was, now you can make an initial prototype pretty quickly. Um, 3D printing is sometimes called rapid prototyping. I don't tend to, tend to tell the students that because rapid to them is five minutes and it does take a few hours to print these things, but, um, but it is much more rapid. So. Anyway, if we can't get people to think engineering is cool with all these fun things, I don't know what we're gonna do. And that is all I really have unless you have questions. And I put this on here, also the face of engineering. Everyone on this, all these football players are either engineers or have taken one of my classes. So, so look for them. <laughs> yes? Is there some strain of uh, scientific engineering? Is there what? Is there some straight scientific engineering in at Dortmund? Like engineering physics or something? Yeah. yeah. Not less building, you mean? We do a lot with physics, and there's engineering physics that students will take. Um, a lot of the engineering physicists here at Dartmouth do space-type stuff. Um, but yes, that exists. 
the beauty of engineer, the beauty of Dartmouth in general, I think, is you can make your own major and it can be pretty interdisciplinary. So you should be able to come up with something that works and fits what you want to do. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is a little aside from the main subject, but when the college builds a new building, like the addition to the library, is the, does the faculty in the engineering school or the students have any participation in that design and building? I mean, some. I'm thinking back to the life sciences building, and I know there were a couple of engineering professors on the group that was, you know, looking at that. I don't know how much, you know, I'd love to see it as a student project where the students could get more involved. Um, I bet if I asked, we could. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. Does anyone else know? No? Yes? There are a number of us here who took uh, civil and structural engineering in the Thayer School in the late 1940s. Go civil. Would we find anything similar in the curriculum? Take my classes. <laughs> <laughs> not, not there. I, I mean, so I teach a structural analysis class. Um, I teach about, so students that want to do structural engineering would take three or four classes with me, often an independent study. Um, I have had two students in recent years, so both of them actually, about three students, uh, go on to get a master's and PhD in structural engineering. One went to Stanford, two are, a second is going to Stanford next fall, and one is at Colorado. So it's possible. I think any path you want to find, you know, it's not, we don't have a department for it, um, but these students have been successful when they went on. So it's possible. Yes? How many students participated in your design and building program? Uh, I had, I, I got close to 50 applications. We accepted 36 and 32 came. And I really only advertised locally because it was a pilot and I was nervous. 32 was a little too many, at least for the first year, <laughs> for as much as we did on the computers and the machine shop. But uh, we're going to talk, we're talking about offering again next year two sessions. Other questions? All right. Oh, the prize. Well, we'd like to really. <laughs>